Hey guys, Luke here from Rock Rhymes. I wanted to take this time to tell you about something very important. If you haven't heard about Anchor, it's the easiest way to make a podcast. In fact, it's what Val and I use to bring you guys the best true crime stories out there. For starters, Anchor has creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. Anchor will distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more podcasting platforms. You can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership, and the best part is, it's all free. It's everything you need to make a killer podcast, pun intended, in one place. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. You know what, we're just going to do it live. <laughs> okay. I think it was Bill O'Reilly who said that. But this is our first episode of Raw Crimes. I'm Luke. And I'm Valerie. And I'm just going to be listening and commentating a little bit. But Val, actually, she wrote the story. She researched the story. So she's going to be telling us a little bit about some crime that actually happened a few blocks away from where we live. So... That's why we decided to choose this story to be our first episode. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely very fitting. Um, so we live in Washington, D.C., and this is the absolutely bonkers case of Robert Eric Wan. And um, I got all my info basically from this one Reddit thread uh, that had a pretty good in-depth discussion of the whole case. And I got some info from a couple other websites that I'll actually post in the, um, the full show notes. So we start off at 11.49 p.m. on Wednesday, August the 2nd at 2000, or in 2006. And 911 dispatchers receive a call from a distraught resident of 1509 Swan Street Northwest in Washington, D.C. And so the caller tells the dispatcher to send an ambulance because somebody in the house has been stabbed by an intruder and is bleeding and unconscious. And we're actually going to play a quick clip of the first bit of this 911 call, so if you're sensitive to that kind of stuff, just go ahead and skip like one minute. D.C. Emergency 911, operator 6752, do you need police, fire, or ambulance? What's wrong, ma'am? We had someone that was in our house, evidently, and they stabbed somebody. Okay, somebody's inside the house now? I don't know. We heard... Are they bleeding? You see someone yes. bleeding? Someone is bleeding in our house. Okay, where's they bleeding from? Uh, I think he was... I think in the stomach. In the stomach? Is he cautious? Uh, Calm down for me. I'm going to send some help, okay? Female or male? It's a male. He's a friend of ours. He was, spent, he was spending the night with us. Okay, and who was the person that stabbed him? Do you know? Is he, is, is he conscious? We need an ambulance. Ma'am, listen no, to me. He's not conscious. He's not conscious at all? No. We need someone right now. Is he breathing? Listen, is he... listen to me. Calm down. I'm going to help you. Okay, is he breathing? I'm upstairs. Okay. Yeah, so that's where it ends. Um, he didn't even answer the question. Yeah, so, I mean, the other, like, the weird part is... You know, amid cries, or <laughs> amid cries, the caller also tells the dispatcher that he's not with the injured man, who is apparently a friend of his, and that his partner told him to go upstairs and call 911 while he stayed with him. So he says that he's upstairs and he's not with the man. And another interesting part of the call was the fact that at one point, the dispatcher actually instructs him to get a dry towel and to consistently apply pressure to the wound and replace it with another dry towel when the first one gets saturated with blood. And so the caller acknowledges and then immediately says that he was stabbed in the heart, despite previously saying that he thought he was stabbed in the stomach. So that was kind of a weird moment. And then the dispatcher asks if he's breathing, and you can actually hear the caller repeat the question, and then what sounds like a female voice responds. And so he then tells the dispatcher that he is breathing, and that his partner is currently applying pressure with a towel, and again says that he has no idea who did it. Now, another part of this call that I kind of want to pick apart is later when the caller goes over the sequence of events. I'm gonna go down. Is this a private home or apartment? It's, it's a home. It's a home. It's 1509 Swan Street, Northwest. The person had one of our, our knives. 
The person that stabbed him ran out the door with a knife? I, I think so. Uh, okay, anybody get any type of description of the person that came in the home? I have no idea. We have no description. We heard we heard the chime and and we heard the scream from our friends. Okay. And so we came running downstairs. We ran in. So you both was upstairs and your friend was downstairs. Yes. You heard the door open and then you heard the scream. We didn't I didn't hear the door open until after the scream and then What? So now it's scream and then door open before it was chime and then scream. What? So in like 10 seconds, he contradicts himself. Yeah, he's just convoluting the story. Yeah, because he said he heard the short, the di the chime. Spit it out, Shvi. <laughs> he heard the chime, which is their security system, and then he heard a scream, and now he's saying he hears a scream and then the door open and chime. Is he trying to like, Make it confusing as to when the person left or came in? I don't know. I think he just, I mean, honestly, it just kind of sounds like he forgot what he was going to say, like what his story was. Because, I mean, yeah, it's just, it's just weird. Oh, and there's like two. We ran down the stairs and we heard, we have an alarm, and so the chime went off. Okay. Is the ambulance, please, we really need the ambulance. Okay, the ambulance. And then he immediately just goes, we really need the ambulance. It's like he just doesn't even finish his full story. <laughs> it's just, oh my god. It's a strange moment. It's a very strange moment. It's just like awkward. So yeah, that's what I was saying. He oh, and then also a part of the um story or I guess a part of the 911 call that you might not have been able to hear. He says we heard the chime and then we heard the scream from our friend and the reason we came running downstairs and he cuts off a little bit and he says we ran into and then it cuts off again. And then he says, I didn't hear the door open until after the scream. And then we ran down the stairs and we heard. And then we have an alarm and so the chime went off. And then that's when he interrupts himself and says that they need help now. And so, I mean, the weird part about that is, of course, him saying that he heard the scream and then, or they heard the door and then the scream. And then a second later, he says he heard the door after the scream and then he also starts saying the sentence we ran into which is it's very clear in the video um so that was just kind of a weird moment and then so the call ends once the paramedics arrive and then the last few seconds are of the caller actually crying on the phone so now we're going to go back to 1974 when robert eric Wan, the victim was born in new york city to parents william and amy Robert grew up in the Chinatown area and was a fourth generation Chinese American. He attended a private Catholic high school in Brooklyn and later attended the College of William and Mary in Williamsburg, Virginia, where he graduated as a Monroe Scholar with a degree in public policy in 1996. Have you ever been to William and Mary? I actually have. Uh, my sister toured it when she was trying to choose colleges. Like, I've been once, and it's just so weird because it's such a tiny town. Like, every freaking house is, is like, two stories max. It's and it so just old. looks so much smaller. Like, I, I think of the childhood home that I grew up in, and it's, like, just shrink it down by, like, half a size, and that's what a two-story house in Williamsburg is, or around William and Mary. Yeah, because it's just so old. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And so this is actually in, in William and Mary, it's actually where he met Joseph Price, the partner of the caller of the 911 call, who is actually Victor Zaborski. And they became fairly good friends. Um, in 1999, Robert graduated cum laude from the University of Pennsylvania Law School. And at the time of the 911 call, um, a few years later, Robert was 32 and he was general counsel for Radio Free Asia which was his new job, and he was also president-elect of the Asian Pacific American Bar Association in D.C. and general counsel to the Organization of Chinese Americans. So he was kind of doing big things. <laughs> um, in 2003, Robert marries Kathy, and the wedding is actually attended by Price and Zaborski, who are now a couple at the time. And so the next year, in 2004, the couple are actually hosted at Price and Zaborski's Capitol Hill townhouse for his 30th birthday. Um, at this point, there were actually three inhabitants of the townhouse. So it was Price, Zaborski, and then Dylan Ward. 
And so Ward was a children's book author, a chef, and a massage specialist. Um, yeah. God. <laughs> he was he was kind of all over the place. He was just kind of, I guess, doing his thing. <laughs> um, and he first actually met Price, and then later the three of them formed a polygamous relationship. And in 2005, Price, Zaborski, and Ward moved to a three-story townhouse at 1509 Swan Street Northwest, uh, down the street from us, <laughs> and they leased out their basement to Sarah Morgan. And so the property had an enclosed yard with an entrance on the first floor, and then Ward's bedroom and like a study slash office room were on the sec was on the second floor. And then Price and Zaborski's master bedroom that they shared was on the third floor. So that's just a quick layout of the house, just so um, for later on, like to get your bearings around the house because it gets a little bit confusing. So fast forward to the summer of 2006, Robert starts a new job at Radio Free Asia at 20th and M Street Northwest. And sometime at the end of the July, he makes plan end of July he makes plans with Price to stay the night. August 2nd, because he wants to take a CLE class, which ends around 9.30 p.m. And so that stands for um, continuing legal education, and it's something that attorneys in the U.S. have to take after passing their bar to continue practicing law, which I didn't know before, <laughs> so that was kind of cool. Um, and he also wants to meet the night staff that night at his new job. And so, oh yeah, so... Robert commutes into DC by metro from a, somewhere around, like somewhere in the Fairfax area. Mm -hmm. yeah. And yeah, and so that like from for anyone who's not in the DC area, that's like a thirty minute, like thirty forty minute metro commute, I guess, into the city. And he lives here with his wife Kathy, and I'm assuming that night, like if he was staying that late, he just didn't want to have to spend another 30 minutes on the metro to get home and get home at like what midnight what time was it 11:30. So, well so he told um he told price who had emailed to make plans that he was gonna get to their house at like 11 something like that after work yeah after well after work and then after his cle class and then after meeting the night staff okay so he, hmm. yeah, and so he didn't, I'm assuming he didn't want to take the metro, um, figured it'd just be easier to stay with a friend, and also he had actually contacted a friend uh, before he contacted Price, and she was, like, unable to accommodate him, so she said no, and so he reached out to Price afterwards. And this is the night that the crime happened, I'm guessing? Yeah, he, he made plans, like, beforehand, because he knew that that night he was going to take that class, and then he was going to stay late and stuff. Okay. Yeah. And, um, so yeah, he told Price he was going to get to their townhouse at, like, 11 p.m. And mm -hmm. so on the night of August 2nd, which is the night that he had made plans with Price, um, at 10.24 p.m., there was a call that Robert placed to Price from his office phone. And according to Ward, around 10.30 to 10.40 p.m., um, uh, Robert arrived at the residence. And, and the reason that Ward uh, remembers this was he was already in bed watching Project Runway. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> so he had kind of a kind of an accurate uh, a time table, I guess. And so according to the three of them, they chat in the kitchen uh, before heading up to bed around like 11 p.m. And just a little after 11, Robert's work BlackBerry phone. Well, has, that really dates it. Yeah. He had, Jeez. <laughs> he had his BlackBerry phone. Um, it actually has two emails drafted to his wife, which is I mean, how they used to communicate, um, about him getting ready for bed. And then also he kind of like talked about this like work lunch that he had the next day. And the emails were never sent. And the phone is actually never collected by the police. Um... And it's never photographed, it's never fingerprinted, and there's some there's some questions about the timestamps actually on those emails. So that kind of comes into play a little bit. And then afterwards, Radio Free Asia, the the company that Robert worked for, uh, wipes the phone clean. 
Um, so this brings us up to date to the 911 call placed by Zaborski at 11.49 p.m. on that August 2nd. So now we're going to go ahead um, and recall kind of what Baker and Weaver, the paramedics who arrived on scene, witnessed. So they arrive around 11.54 to Zaborski standing outside the door in a white robe telling them that someone was stabbed on the second floor. And according to Baker's testimony later in trial, Zaborski was sobbing, but he quoted that it did not seem sincere. Baker and Weaver enter the house and head upstairs where they encounter Ward, whose bedroom was on the second floor, if you remember, mm -hmm. um, also in a white robe. And they ask what's going on, to which Ward does not respond and simply heads into another room. In this room, they see Price in his underwear sitting on a pull-out bed with Robert laying on top of the sheets. So, like, the bed was made and Robert was placed on top of it. Yeah. And, um, actually, they later noted that the, uh, the pillow w had no other impressions on it besides, like, where Robert's head was. So he literally was just placed on top. And Baker later testified that he was immediately suspicious of Price and actually made a note to keep an eye on him because he suspected that he might have a weapon. So that's kind of a strange thing to suspect of what you hope is a witness once you come to a crime scene. <laughs> well, wasn't this a stabbing too? Yeah, it was a stabbing. It's like, if you get stabbed, I don't think you die immediately unless it's some some part of the brain at least. I think if you get stabbed in the heart, you still have like a half a second to move around or something. Yeah, and that's what, I mean, that's what Zaborski said on the 911 call was that he was stabbed, like, in the chest or abdomen or, you know, wasn't really clear because he kind of changed his story a little bit. But, um, yeah, as we later see, like, he he lived after he was stabbed for a little while. So, strange. Jesus. <laughs> um, and so he also noticed that Robert had three stab wounds to his stomach, and it actually looked like they had been wiped up by a towel that was nearby, like on the floor, and it left um, a light film of blood over the wounds. And um, Baker actually testified that it looked, quote, like when you wash a window, like there's like a film of blood over the wounds. And then Price later testified that the three of them had found Juan at the patio door on the first floor, like in the, towards the back of the house. And they had carried him upstairs and placed him on the bed. And Baker testified that the three men were acting strangely and were not distraught in any way, unlike others have been in similar situations. Which, and I mean, both of these paramedics were pretty seasoned paramedics, so they would yeah. know. <laughs> I mean, that's honestly something I don't ever think about. Yeah. Like, when I think of people who come into contact with witnesses, as yeah. well as, of course, victims, but I just never think of the paramedics as being experienced in dealing with the witnesses and knowing how people usually react when it's sincere. Yeah. So. And they had actually, like... So, I mean, we heard on the 911 call that uh, Zaborski seemed pretty distraught, like he was crying. Like, the, the last, like, 30 seconds of the call were just him sobbing into the phone. And then, which is weird, like, to contrast it with the fact that these paramedics showed up and both of them actually said, like, like they had no reason to lie, obviously. And both of them were, like, they did not seem distraught, like... And, and his emotions mm -hmm. seemed display like it wasn't it wasn't sincere, which is weird. By the way, <laughs> I'm not sure if you can hear that, whoever's listening to this. But as we said, we are in D.C. We're actually a mile away from the White House. Uh, it is June, and Black Lives Matter protests are going on right now. And tonight, especially, a lot of fireworks are going off. So if you hear any big booms, uh, that's what it is. Um, and I also ran out of White Claw, so I'm going to go <laughs> grab one while Val keeps the story going. Oh, relating to the matter. <laughs> um, and I can hear you from the kitchen, so it's fun. Go sign some petitions. <laughs> um, anyways. Um, so, yeah. Oh, and the other paramedic, uh, Weaver, he actually testified in court that it appeared to him like Robert had been, quote, showered, redressed, and placed on the bed. So kind of strange to do to 
um, a friend that was staying over that had just been stabbed downstairs. Um, I personally would not redress someone that I had just found stabbed or I would not shower them. And I would also probably not clean their wounds. Well, you're not a good friend, okay? <laughs> um, and then, of course, on scene, neither report any signs of life in Robert, unfortunately. Uh, well, okay. <laughs> He's not moving. He's not breathing. Hmm. He's got a bunch of stab wounds. Which, actually, they had... Um, they had said, uh, Zaborski actually said that he was breathing at the time uh, when he was on uh, the phone call with the dispatcher. So it's a little strange. And also, I don't think I mentioned um, during the call, uh, there was one point when the dispatcher asked, is he breathing? And you could hear Zaborski repeat, is he breathing? And then like in the very background, you can hear a female voice respond like you can't really hear what she's saying but you can hear her talking for a bit and then later later they confirm like he Saborski says that he was breathing he is breathing but he needs help now that was the chick living in the basement right yeah um sarah so that was just a little strange and he actually like during the call you can go listen to it it's on youtube it's like seven minutes long so we didn't want to play the whole thing but you can hear it she Clearly, uh, like, a couple of times during the call, you can hear her speaking, and then Zaborski was saying that he was kind of, he didn't want to go downstairs, like, he was always upstairs, and his partner was with Robert, with the body, and so, um, it seems like he was maybe, like, relaying what the dispatcher was saying to him through Sarah, who was then going into, which is weird, because later in the investigation, you never hear anything about Sarah, so... You never really know what her role is. It's well, also the dispatcher said ma'am when she was talking to Zaborski. Yeah, that's the other thing. Um, some people, yeah, like some people have said that maybe she was trying to be sensitive to the fact that, like, she knew that they were gay men. Maybe she thought he was trans, but I, I don't know. Yeah, but I was, I was saying maybe she mistook the voice in the background that she said was feminine. Yeah, maybe. For, some, for someone else. Yeah, maybe. I mean, you never know. She did keep repeating, ma'am. Um, mm -hmm. That could have just been... Maybe she just... Like, he he has kind of a higher pitch voice. It's not... I wouldn't say it's, like, easily... Like, you can't tell that he's a man, but... I mean... I'm talking I about know. Sarah's voice in the background. Yeah, yeah, but she... You can barely hear her voice occasionally, so... Okay. Yeah. It's just... It's just all around strange. <laughs> it's just, like, a weird image if you try to picture that scene that night of him upstairs and like what Sarah running up and down the stairs yeah because they were on he was on the third floor calling from his bedroom and then this had all happened on the second floor in that like office room office study room so. mm -hmm. anyways um Robert's stuff oh yeah in the room so Robert's stuff had been completely left undisturbed on a dresser like um he had his personal belongings. He actually had two wallets, um, which some people, I don't know, the Reddit thread said that he actually kept one wallet for, like, if he was ever robbed. Like, he would give him that wallet. I don't know. Apparently, he had two wallets, and both had cash in them, and he just had, like, all this kind of stuff that was completely undisturbed on the nightstand. And then... Um, his wife, Kathy, later confirmed that he was found wearing, like, a shorts and t-shirt that he always wore to bed. Like, that was his, like, sleeping clothes. And, um, he also had his anti-teeth, like, grinding mouth guard that he always wore to bed. Um, so, it, like, why, I don't know. I mean, why would he have that in if he was found downstairs by the, by the patio door? If he was mm -hmm. clearly, clearly, like, getting ready for bed or in bed. So, it's a little strange. Um, at the scene, they also recovered a knife. And it was later identified as one of their kitchen knives. And it was on the nightstand with Robert's blood on it. The next day, detectives searched the residence and discovered a pretty suspicious scene. Um, first, all electronics and expensive items were left undisturbed, and there was no sign of a struggle anywhere in the house, along with no signs of forced entry. And so Price um, actually talked about 
how later or earlier in the evening after dinner he had gone out into the patio to check on something and he thinks that maybe that's when he left the patio door unlocked and so that's how he thinks the intruder got in they kind of all say that like he must have gotten in through the back door was it the door that chimes or is it just the front door no uh, apparently both of their doors chime because they had a security system throughout the house so that's the other thing um if both of their doors chime and they had their security system on that they had that they heard the front door chime when the killer was supposedly escaping how did they not hear him come in the window <laughs> but the there chimney were, but he's there santa claus <laughs> there are no signs of, of forced entry and they never pointed to anything else being unlocked i mean it's definitely possible but it's just a little strange um uh, fact, I guess. And the so the backyard was fenced too, and apparently the fences were pretty high, so it would have been hard to scale. And again, if it was a complete unknown stranger, I mean, I don't I don't get the point of scaling a fence and then coming in through a door that you don't you don't know if it's unlocked or locked. You just walk in and you go up to the second floor to kill someone, clean up, and then leave through the front door without making a sound? For, for what reason? Nothing was stolen, nothing, there's no signs of a struggle, there's like nothing. And well, actually no, you wouldn't go upstairs, I guess you would, cause, cause they testified that he was killed, that they found him by the patio door. And then they just cleaned him up and, <laughs> and pat, him on the patted bed. his hair into place <laughs> and just left him. Tuck, tucked him in, said goodnight, <laughs> kissed him on the forehead. <laughs> the, the paramedics will be here soon. Don't worry. Yeah, and I mean, it just it just doesn't make sense. Why would an intruder break into this house in a, a fair like a fairly protected neighborhood and house and very protected? I'm not sure what it was like in 2006, but. It is a very high-end neighborhood. It's probably the same. They sold the house for like 1.5 million, or they bought the house for like 1.5 million. It's probably going for 3 million now. It's, it was sold for like 2.5 million, yeah. My God. Um, so, again, uh, like clear holes in their story. Um, I don't really, <laughs> again, doesn't really make sense what the motive would be for this killer, for this supposed random, random spree killer that just... Uh, walked into their house, killed a man, cleaned the body because there was a very little blood. I mean, we'll we'll post pictures about it, and you guys can find like all the pictures online. Like they're pretty easy to find. Um, the kitchen towel or the towel that they had used um, to apparently like quote unquote apply pressure to the wounds, like the nine one one dispatcher had told them to, has like four very distinct blood like spots on it and they're very small they're very contained it it doesn't it doesn't add up at all with someone who was just stabbed and is just bleeding from their heart their abdomen and their lung so um with that again electronics expensive items are left undisturbed no sense of struggle um in Ward's room on the second floor, they find a, they found copious amounts of BDSM toys and material like books and stuff and machines. They actually uh, describe one which uh, might <laughs> what is it coming in? Which <laughs> might come <laughs> come it, it it comes into play later if you think about it. Um, there's one machine that Ward apparently had that was um, able to like you you place it on someone basically and it like you can make it like self ejaculate that person. AKA something I need to find myself. <laughs> um, and and so. They found a bunch of that stuff, and they also, since Ward was a, like, chef on the side, I guess, they found, like, a cutlery set, like, a set of knives, and a knife, one knife was missing, and that knife was four and three quarters inches in length, so keep that in mind, just one four, four inch knife, almost five inch knife, I would say, uh, missing, 
And so then later when interrogated, Price and Zaborski kept the same story, uh, though they were separated when they were interrogated actually by police. And they had said that the three had chatted with Robert when he arrived, and then they heard a scream around 11.30 p.m. And upon discovering Robert had alerted Ward to the situation, so like Ward did not say that he woke up from the scream, did not say he heard a scream. He said, he basically said that he heard Price scream when he found Robert. And so that's when he found out what was going on. And then, oh yeah, and Price also made a point to tell investigators that he had moved the knife. So that might explain any fingerprints that they might find on the weapon. So he was very clear to cover up the fact that there might be any of his fingerprints on the weapon. That's very suspicious, especially <laughs> if it's your knife. Of course, your fingerprints are going to be on it. Yeah, you're just like, oh, by the way, I moved the knife, so disregard any fingerprints on it. <laughs> um, although police never found any fingerprints on the knife. Because everything was cleaned. Yeah, the scene was very clean, very strange. Absolutely no blood except for on that towel and like a slight film of blood on top of the wounds. Not even in the victim. That's a lie. <laughs> um, and again, later, uh, when they actually had cadaver dogs search the place, like they had bloodhounds search the apartment building, or the, not the apartment building, the townhouse. And so since they had said that they found him by the patio door on the first floor and then they had for some reason carried him upstairs again for some reason why would you carry someone upstairs um they <laughs> oh my god it's just so stupid i don't get oh he's dead <laughs> like they let's had clean couch. him let's bring him upstairs like he's not fucking jesus or anything they had a couch on the first floor there's no reason to bring him upstairs why break a sweat to make it look pretty for the paramedics exactly like they, why not make it easier for whoever's coming into the case like whoever's coming into the uh the house even in 2006 i'm pretty sure people know not to mess with a crime scene that's the other thing that's the other thing why would you again like every like the both the, both of the paramedics on scene said that the crime scene had been cleaned the body had been cleaned so why why do that in any case if you think that it's just weird um so later actually when they had cadaver dogs come in they found they alerted to uh two different scents of blood in the house uh that hadn't been uh properly cleaned up after the case one was actually outside of the patio and it was like kind of where the hose was that they had Put them hoes up. <laughs> so they had, they had a hose out there, um, and they found, like, scents of blood. Like, dogs alerted to the scents of blood over there. And then the other place that they had found a uh, scent of blood was they had um, in the dryer, like, lint trap that the dogs alerted uh, that they sensed blood. A lot of cleaning going on. A lot of cleaning. Especially for 11.30 p.m. <laughs> yeah. And it, it really suggests, I don't want to make too many assumptions, but it really suggests that if they did find him there, even giving them the benefit of the doubt, it seems like somebody went outside, washed off the blood, and then put their clothes in the dryer. Because... They had found blood in those two specific spots, where the hose was, and then where the dryer was, in the lint trap. So again, very strange scene. Um, so basically, if you ever want to clean up your murder, <laughs> clean the lint trap. You no. may You may be able to clean up your clothes. <laughs> Don't clean the lint trap. <laughs> <laughs> or the bloodhounds will get you. Um, so that night, um, unfortunately, Robert is pronounced dead at George Washington Hospital at 12.25 a.m. And he was actually dead on arrival because, again, he had been stabbed three times in the heart, abdomen, and the, his right lung. Uh, autopsy shows that he died through, due to those three puncture wounds, and each wound was four to five inches in depth. 
uh, <clears throat> pretty much the size of Ward's missing four and three quarters inch knife. Not making any suggestions. <laughs> We're not saying anything, but that's basically four to five inches. I would classify that knife as four to five inches in length. Trust me, I know four <laughs> to five inches, okay. Um, and the medical examiner noted that she was actually really surprised, and this was in her testimony. She was surprised that the wounds were all inflicted from the same direction which is very unusual in a situation where there like, would be a struggle by an unknown assailant, which you would assume there would be if he was, as the story goes, as the three men said, stabbed by like an unknown intruder by the patio door. Um, so no drugs were found in Robert's system, although they're very clear to note that not every possible drug was tested for, which leaves the possibility for like a few different drugs and possibly anesthetics to have been injected considering about five different puncture wounds were actually discovered on his body. Five different puncture wounds. Again, pretty strange. And his wife, Kathy, had said that he had he didn't have puncture wounds when he left that morning. Like he, I mean, yeah, he didn't have puncture wounds. What do you mean by puncture wounds? Like knife wounds or no not knife wounds the, the the only three knife wounds that he had were in his chest like stomach. yeah but what do you mean by puncture wounds like needle puncture wounds oh oh shit yeah yeah five different ones out of his body damn that's like five, <laughs> five times the amount tom hanks got in inferno <laughs> um so yeah, and again, he like there's obviously no signs of a struggle. He had absolutely no defensive wounds, like nothing on his hands, nothing anywhere, except for the three on his chest, which is very strange. If someone breaks into your house and they just stab you and you what, just stand there? Let it happen. <laughs> it's weird. My, my time has come. It's weird. Um, no signs of struggle, and he actually, uh, autopsy actually revealed that he could have lived up to a minute after the initial stab wound because they were, I mean, five inch stab wounds and they like, yeah, they wouldn't have killed you immediately. So, and also his own semen was found in his anus, in his anal cavity and around his genitals. And they tested that semen and it was 100% proven to be no one else's. It was his own semen. Oh, God. Which reminds you, I might remind you, of that one machine, shall I say, that Ward had in his room that was able to self-ejaculate a person. My guess is he's super flexible with his penis. <laughs> Probably not. But, but we'll go with the machine for now. Um... Again, the towel that was found in the room, as I had mentioned earlier, that, and on the call you can hear um, Zaborski say that his partner was, he was like, the, the, the dispatcher asked if he could apply pressure again, and he was like, yeah, yeah, my partner is doing that, like he's applying pressure right now, like I told him to do that. So that towel, there's only one towel found in the room, despite... The dispatcher saying that, like, because she had heard that he had been stabbed. So she had told uh, Zaborski that, like, apply one towel, and after that towel is completely saturated with blood, find another towel and place it on top without removing the other towel, just so that you have, like, a constant stream of pressure. And you would have a lot of blood that you would need to do that. You would need to switch out towels if someone was stabbed in the heart, in the abdomen. And again, they only found one towel that had four very distinct spots of blood on it. And that's it. It was a white towel with four, so with four um, spots of blood. And that was all that they had found on scene. Light bleeder. Apparently. <laughs> and that towel actually had some marks that were consistent with the action of wiping a knife on it and no signs of it actually being used to apply pressure, as I said. And yeah, I mean, there's pictures of all these stuff. You guys can go find them online. It, it's crazy to think that someone who was stabbed and who was told by the dispatch 
to apply pressure and they said yeah, yeah yeah we're applying pressure don't worry about it and then they come and they find this towel with no signs of being applied um, on anything so anyways um, police investigators basically came to their own conclusion and they alleged that Robert was drugged with a paralytic agent that they had never tested for because a standard autopsy a, a standard tox screen doesn't uh, doesn't account for all the paralytic agents that you can find and sexually assaulted and then stabbed to death and then cleaned and the scene staged and actually sometime between 11 and 11 35 a neighbor William Thomas heard a quote-unquote desperation scream from the residents which suggests that if he had heard the scream as early as 11 it basically gave the man about 50 minutes until they called 911 and even if he had heard it at the tail end, 11.35, it still gives about, what, 19 minutes until they called? Because they called at 11.49. Yeah. So that's still a very big amount of time. Peculiar. To account for. If, especially due to their story, saying that they, I don't know, heard the door and then the scream, or heard the scream and then the door, and then immediately called 911. So again, it doesn't add up because at the very tail end of that, it would have given him 19 minutes. So, which is more than enough time to bring someone upstairs, uh, bathe them or clean them, clothe them, and basically clean up the scene. I want to know how they did their laundry that fast. <laughs> like, damn. <laughs> Just dry her and I guess they'll put it somewhere because two of the men were wearing bathrobes, white robes, and one was in his underwear. At 12 o'clock a.m. Yeah, which isn't strange if you sleep in underwear and then you put on a bathrobe. But it, it's just still, it also does account for the fact that you maybe wanted to clean something and came out in your underwear. I don't know. Yeah. So, um... To this day, Robert's murder remains unsolved, and the three men have only ever been charged with conspiracy and obstruction of justice. Um, and they actually now remain free, and I'm pretty sure Price and Zaborski are living in Florida, and Ward is somewhere else, and they're just living their lives. And authorities reject the idea that there was an intruder, citing the fact that, you know, it's highly unlikely that the person could have scaled the fence, uh, the fence door had been locked, and they had gotten into the house through the unlocked back patio door that they would have somehow known that was unlocked for some reason. Um, and then, without triggering the security system, because... Again, as they said, they heard the security system triggered when the front door opened when the guy was escaping. And then um, killed and cleaned Robert and left in the time frame. Um, and then, again, authorities don't believe that the kitchen knife was used to kill Robert because it actually had blood on the sides of the knife, but not on the actual cutting side. And the kitchen knife was actually longer than five inches, Suggesting that the person doing the stabbing had to stop before the whole blade was in Which is very unlikely because when you're stabbing you're not thinking about stopping like halfway through, you know mm -hmm. Like you would just stab stab like you wouldn't you wouldn't just like I've thought about this a lot I've thought about how I'm gonna stab <laughs> someone a lot You wouldn't you wouldn't consciously stab like you wouldn't especially if you're an intruder Someone who doesn't know the house who doesn't know assuming who is in the house why would you be so carefully stabbing someone halfway through before your knife is all the way in? It's called a passionate stabbing. <laughs> you gotta search it up. <laughs> it's not, no, that's very controlled. So yeah, again, weird. And since all the stab wounds were from the same direction at around five, four to five inches, makes sense that if someone had wanted to stab someone who had been subdued due to maybe a paralytic uh, agent and then stabbed as they were just there lying still from the same direction with the with the four to five inch blade like the blade that has actually currently never been recovered the one that was missing from his knife set from Ward's knife set 
Uh, so they um, never found the blade. No. Not well, that damn, I've how's read he gonna anywhere. do his cutlery work? Not that I've read anywhere. They've never found that. I mean, this just sounds like lazy police work, in my opinion. Like they just gave up on the case. They had everything at their fingertips, and they just dropped it. Yeah, I mean, I, I on like I don't know. I don't know how much they could have found. It, it just seems. I mean, yeah, it seems like they could have done more, but. Did they ever face a day in court? Yeah, they did. Well, because they were brought to trial for obstruction of justice. Um, because uh, investigators had like basically proven that they staged the scene. Because he was clean, he was redressed, or no, he wasn't redressed, but he was clean, the bed was made, he was placed on top, he was taken from his like quote-unquote crime scene. That crime scene had been cleaned up, there's no blood anywhere else in the house except for, you know, where the the bloodhounds picked up on it in the, the lint trap and then outside. And, I mean, it was clear that they staged it. Um, also, the knife had white, like, towel fibers on it that they had actually found, the kitchen knife that they had basically probably taken dipped in his blood and placed on the table right next to the bed again not suggesting anything because we don't know what happened <laughs> police don't know what happened you guys listening don't know what happened even after hearing everything that we had to say and then of course the three men denied ever wiping the knife on the towel they never said they did any of that the only thing that they said that they did with the knife was Price said that he took it and he had brought it upstairs and placed it. And that's why his fingerprints might have been on it. So just watch out for that. Because <laughs> his fingerprints might have been on the murder weapon. Quote, unquote. <laughs> Is that it? So, I mean, yeah, that's basically it. There's not much else on the case. Um, since then i like the house is like we we walk by it fairly often it's actually been sold a few a couple of years ago it's some commercial property now isn't it some lawyer yeah why well, i think i think it's a commercial i think it might be a it, real estate place or something um but yeah i hopefully mean hopefully no one's living in it <laughs> be haunted as shit yeah <laughs> um and you know of course Obviously, Robert and his wife, Kate, uh, Kathy, have never received any justice. I mean, I, I don't know how you can uh, kind of excuse this case because clearly he was murdered by someone. And even if, even if uh, investigators had believed that he was murdered by somebody in the house, they still never did their due diligence to um, investigating that maybe it was an intruder. So it's entirely possible, though the scene may have been weird, it's entirely possible that someone could have walked in, very unlikely, but even if that had happened, there was, there was absolutely no investigating done into that, so we'll never know, and we'll probably never, ever know, because it seems like it's gone pretty cold since then. Um, there's really not much else to say about it. Every, uh, the three men are, they're out, they're, they're living their life. Yeah,